In today's show, there was a trade, the Clippers and the Blazers, Norman Powell, Robert Covington. I'm going to break it all down in this show. Mick Bolton, he wants to hear about it. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Wow, wow, wow. Every year this happens. You have a trade that goes down four or five days before the trade deadline and it normally involves pretty significant players. And that's exactly what happened here. It happens quite often with the Clippers, interestingly enough. We had a trade go down in the NBA. So let's break down everything that happened. We will start just by looking at what the actual deal was. Portland and LA involved in a deal. The Clippers get Stormin Norman Powell. They get Bob Cove, Robert Covington. That's it. They give up. Eric Bledsoe, Justice Winslow, Keon Johnson, and a 2025 second round pick, which is one of the Pistons second round picks with one of the four second round picks that the Pistons gave to the Clippers so they would take Luke Kennard, one in one of the more baffling trades of all time. Um, so there you go. There's yeah, five players moving a second round pick. Let's talk about this from a number of perspectives. You see lots of different theories running around. It's very hard to know all of this stuff straight off. Um, you know, nobody knows. We're not inside these guys' heads. But yeah, the, the number one take I'm seeing is, well, if the Clippers are making this move, that means they know that they're getting Paul George and Kawhi Leonard back. And I don't think that's remotely the case. Kawhi, there's no way. Look, I'm just, there's just, I've said this all year. I don't see how Kawhi comes back after tearing his ACL in June, that he's going to come back and make an impact at some point in like March or April. Maybe in the playoffs, he can play a little bit. Uh, Paul George, this injury is lingering and lingering. We're still, you know, February 24th, he's having another, another scan. I don't think this indicates that. What this indicates is they think they're okay now. They can do some sort of work in the playoffs. They don't. It benefits them in no way to tank. They don't have their draft pick. It completely unprotected goes to the Thunder. So they can go in there, get some playoff experience into some guys, show something for the fans, get some revenue in, and that's what and Norm Powell does. But Norm Powell's under contract. And then he provides a really, really good option for them with Kawhi and Paul George next season as they push to become, if not the favorites, one of the favorites for the NBA title next season. As for Covington, he isn't a, a, a free agent, sure. I think this deal is more about getting power than it is Covington, but Covington helps them this year. Just gives them extra depth, and maybe he wants to stick around, and they want him to stick around to play a really interesting role for them next season, because then they'll have his bird rights, and they, it's easier than tax. What do they care? Steve Barmer's worth $100 billion. I think he'll be all right playing a little bit of extra tax, so he's $10 million. I'll, I'll be okay. I think he'll be fine, because he wants to win a title. So getting those guys in, I don't think this is any indication whatsoever that... Paul George, or more particularly, especially after what Ty Lue said yesterday, that Kawhi Leonard is coming back. I don't think that means that at all. On the Blazers side of things, the the trade, look, if you're evaluating this from a what what value did you get in a trade now, they clearly got killed. Like they, they, they got destroyed. They got absolutely nothing back. They're giving away Norman Powell, who they just signed. Yeah, Covington's an expiring deal, whatever. They got nothing. But what it does do is it really just says we are we are tanking our asses off. And they are not finished, I am sure. They are, there are other moves coming, whether that involves Robert, not Robert Covington, Yusuf Nurkic, whether that involves CJ McCollum, I'm not sure. But they are not finished. What this also means to me is that we are not seeing Damian Lillard this season. Lillard is not coming back to fight with a team starting Tony Snell and Ben McLemore. That's, that's not what they're doing. They, um, yeah, I don't actually know what, I don't know what the plan is. These, you know, they've got Bledsoe's there for another year, like Winslow. Look, Keon Johnson, okay, you're taking a flyer on a guy who was picked in the 20s um, and he's actually not good at basketball at this point, but he's got really good athleticism, some good defensive ability. I don't mind taking that flyer. It makes you significantly worse for this year, which is the goal. It'll enable you to move on from other guys as well and, and really start to clear things up for Anthony Simons. And they, and they need to get a three because Norm Powell's not a three, he's a two. I know he's played at the three all season. He, he's, he's, a, he's a two. So it does open things up for them. So in terms of the deal, it's a clear loss in terms of value. But taking a flyer on Keon, 
a 2025 piss in seconds, it might not be that good. Like they might have improved by then. That's three years away. They might have improved a little bit to the, where that's yeah, pick 45 or something, maybe. You'd hope, after they've got Kay Cunningham, another high pick this year, you'd hope that they're up that high. Um, but what it is, it just enables them to get a be better draft pick this year. It doesn't rush Damian Lillard back. They can start to tear things down properly instead of fighting for the ninth seed every year. Um, so this is, yeah. I mean, when you look back and say what they did to get Norman Powell and giving up first round picks and a younger player in Gary Trent, like that, that's shit house, obviously. And dumping Norman Powell to get worse is a bad move. And on the surface of it, it is a, it is a shocking trade. It is a really, really bad trade. But I think again... Is Powell any part of a future on this team? Probably not. Should they have signed him to that deal? Probably not. Um, should they have traded him for him in the first place? Probably not. Um, but you can't go back and relitigate that stuff. So you've got to sort of just move forward with a clean slate. So I'm not saying it's a good deal for the Blazers. I'm not saying they won the deal or anything remotely close to that. But in the end, it might actually benefit them while taking a really big hit now in value. And surely you could have done something different with this, these players in a trade. But what it does do is it helps... It helps really focus in what your goal is this year. Um, and they might, they literally, they might win three more games the rest of the year. That, that's a possibility, especially if they do move on from McCullum and from Nurkic. We're going to get into the individual team values here um, and what happens fantasy-wise uh, in, in a second. But that's just my overall thoughts on how the, uh, how the trade went down. Better line has you covered this season. More props, more odds. More lines than ever before, heading towards the Super Bowl in about a week's time. BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just football. BetOnline has all the up-to-the-minute up info on pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, along with real uptight, uh, real-time real updates on current games. Don't wait to take advantage of the all-new amazing offers available for the 2022 season. BetOnline is where the game starts. We're going to trade deadline show. Locked on NBA, Thursday. February the 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern is the deadline. Our show starts at 2 p.m. Eastern, one hour before, and we go through to 4 p.m. We'll be talking about this trade for sure with Kim Becker as the host, Johnny Corrales and myself breaking down all the deals, getting all the Locked On Network hosts on to talk about their specific teams and all the things that do go on. So check out the Locked On NBA YouTube channel when we go live on Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern next week. All right, so let's look at the actual moves, the deals, how all this, well, not the deals, the fantasy implications here. In Portland, I do not think that Portland is done. So while everything I say here is how I feel at the moment, three days time, this could be very different. Larry Nance is questionable to return to action today. So you would assume he just takes back the starting spot over Robert Covington and eventually works his way back close to 30 minutes. So if he's on your wire, you go and grab him. He, he he could be traded. He, they could also say, I know your knee's rooted, like sit down a few more games. That's possible. But we don't know that. They don't, really, they don't have huge, you know, great players here. CJ McCollum gets a boost. He'll get more usage and more minutes until he is traded. If he's traded. Trenton Watford's an interesting one. Who's going to start at the three on this team? It was Powell. Um, is it CJ Allaby? Is it Tony Snell? Well, if it's Tony Snell, we know there's no fantasy value there. It could be Snell. Is it Trendon Watford? That's the interesting one. I've been talking about Watford for a few weeks now, saying I'm quite interested in what he's bringing. I still remain very interested in what he's bringing. He's six foot nine. He's like a three slash four. He's not doing huge amounts this year. Four points, shooting sixty three percent from two. He averages three boards, half a block in those 11 minutes. There's, there's some okay numbers there. Um, I, yeah. He's a player that I'm not sure is going to crack into. I think he's going to play 20 plus here, right? I don't think he's going to be a 12-team league ad though. I think the 12-team guys are going to be Simons, McCullum, Nurkic, and Nance. That's it. But it does improve the value of Watford. I think pretty significantly. Yeah, I, I think it, I think it jumps it up pretty significantly. Um, just looking, he, he's on a two-way contract. I don't think he's played a single game for the G League or in the G League. The Blazers do not know how to use the G League at all. 
No idea. Yeah, has not played a single game. What's the fucking point? Um, CJ McCollum and Anthony Simons get boost. Someone, multiple people message me. They go, man, is, is Anthony Simons become droppable now? Man, he's going to lose value. P Eric Bledsoe's shit house, guys. Like, this is in no way, if anyone, and what this means to me is, find the person in your league has Anthony Simons, and maybe they're one of these weird panickers, and try and get him for cheap. It, I could not believe my eyes when someone asked me whether Anthony Simons was droppable because Eric Bledsoe was coming in. I could not believe what I was seeing. So, yeah, look, his numbers are going to go up. Norman Powell was hurting him a little bit with shot attempts. Um, it's, yeah, his, his value's going up. Same as CJ. Justice Winslow's value goes up. Now, the problem I have with Justice Winslow for fantasy, right, is the only times he's ever really been successful is when A, he was playing as a point guard in Miami, which he's not going to do here, or B, this little run he's had playing at center for the Clippers. His nominal position as a draft player was uh, he's a small forward, but every time he's played on the wing, it's been a disaster because he either needs the ball in his hands to create or he needs to be close to the rim as a center and play defense. On the wing, he is completely lost. The problem here is Anthony Simons is playing a point guard and Yusuf Nurkic is playing at center. And the only opening they have is on the wing. Is this just a horrific evaluation from Joe Cronin as to what Winslow's position is? Did he have him in his fantasy team and say, oh yeah, he's a small forward. We can play him at small forward because he's dreadful at small forward. Maybe that, maybe that doesn't stick. Maybe he becomes improved, but we have seen this for five years. Point guard Winslow, not bad. Center Winslow, not bad. Wing Winslow, shocking, dreadful, really, really bad. I wouldn't be adding Justice Winslow in 12-team leagues. There is a chance that he starts at the three. There, he could. It could be him. It could be CJ Allaby, who's going to get a little bit of a bump as well. It could be Trenton Watford. I think they're probably your options. It could be, or it could be Tony Snell. So I wouldn't be adding him either. And then Eric Bledsoe. Does Eric Bledsoe get a boost? Well, he probably plays a little bit more. He will take away, we'll talk about this in a second, he'll take away from Dennis Smith. He'll be the backup point guard. But CJ and Simons are going to play 36 each. So that gives you 24 guard minutes. Bledsoe might get 24, but there's also Benny McLemore, there's also Smith. So I'm not sure that Bledsoe every night gets 24, and I wouldn't be adding him in 12 team leagues. If we look at the players that lose value on the Blazers, I think it's just Dennis Smith, who was like 16, 17 minutes a night as the backup point guard. And I think Bledsoe takes over that which pushes... Smith might still stay in the rotation because they just honestly don't have many rotation caliber players. But it won't be at like 17 or 18 minutes a night. I'd find it hard to believe that he was able to stay in, um, in that sort of range. But what I don't find hard to believe is that Bilt Bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. You know why? Because I've lived the experience. I know that it's brilliant. I've had Bilt Bars. I've sat there with rappers just surrounding me, sitting in bliss, knowing that I've tasted the best protein bar ever. Because instead of like a candy bar, which let's be honest, they taste good as well, but they're so full of fat and sugar and carbs and calories that it's not good for you. Whereas Built Bar tastes like that, tastes great, but the calories are low, the fat is low, the sugar is low, and the protein is up through the roof, right up, 17 grams, great. So get yourself Built Bars. Go to Built.com, load up your cart with cookies and cream. That one's on. That's on on me. That tip, cookies and cream, um, and get the discount. Lock 15. L O C K E D 15. Built Bar is built different. Let's look at it from the uh, Clippers perspective. Who gains in value? Kids, I apologize. Absolutely fucking nobody. Nobody gains in value. I, I, I don't think. Now, again, I have arguments, discussions, discussions, debates with people. Some go, oh, Norman Powell, his value is going to go up. He's now the, the main guy there. What? I don't see it at all. He's playing like 35 minutes a night in Portland. And while CJ and Simons were getting their shots, this I've been complaining about this Clippers rotation for a long time. Saying they have got too many blokes. Norman Powell is not that good where he comes in. It's like, all right, guys, Norm's here. Everyone take a step back. All right, Norm's got it. All you guys need to sit back down and I am in control. He is not that player. He is not that good. So what it almost means is you're going to have 10 blokes playing 24 minutes a game. That's what is potentially going to happen here. So I don't think there's any way that Norman Powell comes in and improves his value. Like he's not going to get a huge spike in usage. He's not going to get a huge spike in minutes. Those two things I think will probably come down. Or well, usage might actually stay the same, but instead of 35 minutes, he plays 30 or 29 or 28. Um, 
I think it's going to be, again, pretty ugly for the Clippers. It was already really, really ugly. I am I am not expecting Kawhi to play. I am also not expecting Paul George to play this season. I, I don't know that, but that is my expectation. And this move here, it brings in two guys, and it's going to further, further complicate things. I think all of these players lose value. Marcus Morris, Amir Coffey, Luke Kennard, Norman Powell, Robert Covington, Isaiah Hartenstein, Ivica Zubats, Nico Batum, Terrence Mann. I don't know if I mentioned this, and I should have before. I don't think there's any way Damian Lillard's returning this season. You should have dropped him weeks ago. Surely this is the impetus you need to drop him. Um, so why are all these guys going down? Well, Justice Winslow was playing like 20, 18 minutes, backup center sort of minutes. So he's out of the rotation. Bledsoe was playing like 19 minutes as a backup guard. I think Powell's playing more than 19 minutes. I think Covington's playing more than 19 minutes. So those guys are going to come in and squeeze value. Amir Coffey and Nick Batum were starting. I don't think Amir Coffey's starting anymore. I think I think Powell's going to start. Or maybe it's Batum that doesn't start. But regardless, everyone is losing minutes. I think Reggie Jackson, maybe, considering he's the only point guard on this team, although Luke Kennard will handle backup point guard is my guess now. I think everyone loses minutes. Jackson maybe is the only guy who doesn't. Marcus Morris loses a little bit off the top. Zubats and Hartenstein, instead of them splitting the center minutes, you're going to get a lot of Covington playing at the five, I think. So it hurts both of them. Covington was playing 34 minutes a night. There's no way he's playing that for the Clippers. Surely not. Marcus Morris loses. Luke Kennard, who was playing 29 minutes and already started to drop off. Maybe he plays 24 now. I think you could drop him. Amir Coffey who's all over the place anyway. Just another name to add into the mix now with Powell, who's going to hurt him. Nick Batum, instead of 25, maybe he plays 22 minutes. Terrence Mann, who's already gone to the bench. Uh, Terrence Mann, literally, if I was coaching him, I'd be playing BJ Boston over him. I don't think Terrence Mann is that good. And Terrence Mann's going to lose all his value. He's not a 12-10 league guy anyway. So if I had Coffey, Canard, Hardenstein, Zubats, but two more man in a 12-team league, I'd move on from all of them. I would hold Reggie Jackson. I would very softly hold Marcus Morris, but not confidently. I would hold Covington and Powell. I think they lose, but not completely. And, and that's it. Coffee, Kennard, Hartenstein, Zubats, Batum, man. I think you can all... That all depends on if there's someone out there to add on your wire that you think. But I, I really, really am going to find it hard for any one of these guys to be consistent enough to hold on to. Canard, Coffee, Man, Boston, Zubats, they're all, I think he's going to have about six or seven blokes who rank between 130 and 170. With Powell, probably the only guy who can stay ahead of that number. Um, and Covington, who knows how they use him. We already, we already knew how confusing it was with Coffee and Canard and Batum and all those guys. And it gets worse now because you're adding another player into that mix. Instead of 19 minutes for Bledsoe, you've got 30 minutes from Powell. So those 11 minutes need to come from somewhere. Instead of 20 minutes for Winslow, you might get 26 minutes of Robert Covington. So those six or seven minutes need to come from somewhere. And then usage got to change. It's, it's, it's a whole mess. And I could be very wrong on all this stuff. Maybe they say, well, Amir Coffey's our future. They're wrong. Maybe they say Amir Coffey's their future and they want to play him 32 minutes. And Amir Coffey's fine as a rotation guy. Maybe they play him 32 a night and keep Powell in a smaller role. I, I honestly just don't see how that, why that would happen. So it's a whole mess. And we'll watch how it unfolds over the next couple of days. If you are here on YouTube, let me know. What do you think of this trade? How badly did Porton get rooted in this one? It was, how bad was the trade from? What does it do for fantasy? Do you disagree with me? Do you think that Norman Powell is going to just spike in value? Do you think that Anthony Simons is going to become droppable? What do you think is going to happen? Leave it in the comments below, guys. That's it. Follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. I will be back later on with a what to watch for for Saturday. And if you are here on YouTube, do all those things that I just said. Thumb it up as well. Subscribe, notification bell, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.